In the beginning, there was consciousness. Then, underneath the stardust, a vibration emanating from the consciousness fathered the world. This is to remind us that everything, those things that endure as well as those things that die, were made by this unique energy. The rock was embedded there, on a level table with the earth, incandescent like a blazing fire. The sacred rock is called Uluru, in spite of those non-believers who call it Ayers Rock. It peaks at 350 meters, but the biggest monolith in the world is an iceberg of stone of which we can only see the unearthed part. Two-thirds of the colossal mass sinks into the intimate parts of the Earth. Not far from there stands Mount Artula, known under a name that the colonists have also falsified, Mount Connor. From one end, Artula curves and bends in gentle hills that take the shape of the waves of a rainbow snake. On the other, the mountain stands against the wind of the desert, showing a manly and abrupt facade erected in a semicircle. He who would throw himself from the top of this cliff would understand that the world is moored below like a dream clinging to the riggings of sleep. In the shadow of these giants passes some transient creatures. The rocks, however, have been there for hundreds of millions of years. At the feet of these blocks of eternity, and as if secreted by them, stretches the savanna that comprises all of the center of Australia. We can see some fleeting creatures roaming around. For a long time now, we have forgotten where they came from. The dingo is a canine, often ginger in color, a descendant of the wolf who lived in the Orient. We know now that he crossed the seas on the ships of man more than 4,000 years ago to get to his new Australian territory. With him lingers the reputation of a nomad, the perpetual stranger, the unloved. He's a bohemian, a gypsy of the last continent. Some solitary dingoes, vagabonds, cross each other's paths around Mount Artula. They are only passing by. For this red and oxidized ocean belongs to another. So it was the will of the Supreme Consciousness who created the universe. That which is constant had to be established first. The desert, the water, the atmosphere, the earth. Then came that which is temporary, and which must die one day. The animals, the plants, the societies. But everything from a water drop to an atom of chlorophyll, from a grain of sand to an organic cell, is made of stardust and must keep its assigned place in the dance of the cosmos. The lord of this piece of desert is called Paraji which means lightning in the Diari language. For Paraji, a young male, Mount Artula is a landmark as good as a companion. The rock has known to protect him since his birth for more than four years ago. Today, the animal turns toward his redstone friend each time he needs to orient his life or strengthen his dream. 
For if we believe the message of the real men, the Aborigines, Australia isn't a country, but the land of a dream. We are born when our dream begins, and we die when it ends. Between birth and death lies the time of the dream. It is this way for everything that lives. That which we believe to be real is only a film projected on the screen of our unconsciousness. We must begin the story of Paraji the dingo, who lived the time of his dream at the feet of the sacred rocks. It is the time in which his dream must come to life, be populated and colorized. Everything begins by a vibration of the spirit who is falling asleep. The Lord of the desert throws himself onto his life. In the dream of Paraji, there will be rocks and deserts, waterfalls and eucalyptus forests. But there will also be an island that bathes the cool waters of the South Australian basin. We call it Kangaroo Island. Separated from the rest of Australia almost 10,000 years ago, its remoteness made it a sanctuary for the emblematic animals of the last continent, the kangaroos. On Kangaroo Island, a family shares the warmth of a lazy sun. Here is Cartania, whose name in the Karuna dialect means the eldest of her family. Close to her is her younger brother, Yam. In the pouch of Cartania, a young being is awakening, desiring to offer himself also to the light of the day. All through this dream, all through this narrative, he will be called Pogo. The awakening of Pogo does not disturb his mother, Cartania, at all. For a few weeks, she has been used to this life on her stomach, like an outgrowth of her own body. Pogo will stay in Cartania's marsupial pouch for 42 weeks in total. Yam, the little brother of Cartania belongs, like her, to a species of western grey kangaroos. Not far from Cartania, we see the one who gave them life, Burka. Her name refers to the matriarch of the family. The eucalyptus present on Kangaroo Island have dominated the Australian landscape for several millions of years, when the virgin forests started to regress to the benefit of the open forests and those more temperate. The leaves of this tree constituted the food for a little marsupial, the koala, and the two species, the plant and the animal, crossed the stream of time together. When he wants to seize the foliage, the koala unfortunately suffers from a handicap, poor vision. 
In the wild, trying to grab his food often becomes for him a laborious task. Small, round, plush, and clumsy. The koala is obliged to comb his fur without ceasing, one of the most dense fur coats of the animal kingdom. The fur is inextricably entangled one to the other and forms a method of thermal insulation that protects the animal from the wind as well as the heat. While the koala fights with his meal, the family of western gray kangaroos lounges around. Alone between his sister Cartania and his mother Burka, the young yam seems to arouse himself a little. He awakens and wants to, without any further delay, proceed to groom himself. Cartania does not share in her brother's impatience. Her stomach still quivering, she is waiting for Pogo to calm down in her smooth pouch, obscure and warm. Yam continues his grooming by washing his legs. A calloused skin covers the part which comes in contact with the ground. This granular coating, which is of a texture similar to rubber, guarantees the kangaroo a perfect adhesion to the rocky ground, whether it be wet or dry. Cartania is hopeful that when Pogo has stopped rushing around in the bottom of her marsupial pouch, Yam will in turn calm down. Suddenly, Cartania's ears, independent housings one from the other, pick up a noise in the distance. Yam, who has finally lied down, remains indifferent. Their mother, Burka, is starting to groom herself when the echo of a crash will soon interrupt her. It is enough to make the wind rise upon the bay and cause the sea to beat against the coast of Kangaroo Island. It will only take a few minutes for the squalls to reach the inland. At the first swayings of his perch, the koala understands that he must make use of the exceptional muscular strength in his arms, which will give him solidarity with the tree to which he clings. 
For this purpose, nature has equipped his palms with rough cushions and his hands with powerful claws that plunge into the bark. The eucalyptus forests are indispensable to the survival of the koalas. They make up their unique habitat, and when they diminish, the animal wastes away, as if in exile in his own land. The eucalyptus is as necessary to him as water is to fish. For a koala, no two trees exist which are similar one to the other. There are more than 600 species of eucalyptus, some of which are counted amongst the highest trees in the world. The animal will show a decided preference when confronted with two of these types of trees. However, another koala could make a different choice. Each one prescribes for himself his own diet according to gustatory and olfactory criteria, or according to his digestive tolerance. Koalas require not only that the trees endure, but moreover that several species of eucalyptus exist in the same forest. Soon, another ravaging wind will have bent the last of the eucalyptus forests. The storm of humanity already tears, scarring the plants where the last of the koalas live. It happens in April, when the last of the souvenirs of the wet, the wet season, have not yet completely evaporated. The great scarlet desert still accepts the caresses of water. Soon, like a poisoned tunic, it will reject everything that is cool, liquid, or simply wet. But for the moment, Paraji the dingo accompanies his two children to the edge of the magic waters. Waka, the little female with her ears circumflexed, and Kintala, the young male who will inherit his lineage. Paraji crosses the river without hesitation, for he knows the least deep point. His children, who set out on their own, stop abruptly in their tracks due to the fear of getting wet. Soon, Waka finds the ford where her father has known where to pass. Her brother, Kintala, more prudent, will join up with them with less assured steps. Paraji begins to sniff. He is looking for something like a treasure whose location has been forgotten. Under a thicket, Paraji finally finds the piece of meat that he had buried under a thin layer of earth in anticipation of a meal to come. No matter that his two children have followed him, they know that they will not be allowed to eat before their father has started the feast. In order to distract himself and stave off his hunger, Kintala, the young male, decides to play and explore the world, activities which his sister Waka would not feel were foreign.
It's towards the water that this curiosity lures Kintala, who does not understand that his sister prefers to stay close to their father and wait for the crumbs that may still not come. Finally, Paraji determines that the moment has come to offer his children their share of the meat. After a brief struggle, it's Waka that grabs the spoils, and in turn, she may concede that the leftovers should go to her brother, Kintala. Indifferent to the rivalry of his young, Paraji sleeps in order to digest this dish that he had the wisdom to save in one of his meat lockers scattered around his territory. Back at the koalas, four-fifths of the day has been devoted to sleeping. On Kangaroo Island, an absence of predators means that sleep doesn't render one vulnerable. If he has need of protection, his camouflage would do the job. His body takes on the color of bark, and when seen from the bottom, his hindquarters, those of clouds. Night falls somewhere to the north of the island continent. It's the hour in which the red flying foxes assemble in colonies that can number during this season a million inhabitants who prepare to attend to their nocturnal activities. As if the flesh of the trees was coming undone in flying pieces, the sound of their cheeping and the flapping of their wings will soon make the heavens tremble. Red flying foxes are nomads. They temporarily colonize places where they know they can find food which they'll exhaust in a few weeks. Then they'll migrate to another area of abundance.
Unlike many others, bats notably the smallest, the Australian red flying fox, like the black flying fox, does not benefit by a system of echolocation. They must leave it to their eyes, especially adapted for night vision, as well as a particularly acute sense of smell. It's this sense of smell that permits them to identify their food, foliage, fruits, berries, saps, and other vegetal secretions. A little marsupial observes them in the backlighting, a brush-tailed possum. He stuffs himself with leaves that would be toxic poison to any other animal. It's the hour to eat for all nocturnal marsupials. The brush-tailed batongs that jog in the underbrush never consume water, neither food that is green nor wet. They only eat insects, resins, and above all, mushrooms, which are digested in a pre-stomach pouch. These will have started to break up before passing into the true stomach. A cousin of the brush-tailed batong, the rufous batong, is present at the meal of his closest relatives. These relatives arrived ahead of him because the rufous batong leaves his nest every night, more than 40 minutes after the setting of the sun. Jealous of the apparent success of his rivals, he commences his search for tender blades of grass, little roots, or flowers. Not far from there, a young red kangaroo firmly encamped on the counterweight of his tail gets along well with a northern hairy-nosed wombat. Very rare and in danger of extinction, this wombat dreads the heat and doesn't leave his terrain until well into the coolness of the night. It's then that he discovers with the tip of his nose the young shoots that can grow up underneath the litter of the underbrush. Dreading to leave a clear field open to other consumers, the brush-tailed possum finally has descended from his tree, but his presence will leave the wombat indifferent. The wombat belongs to a family near enough to the koala that he shares some extremely delicate tastes in food. This is a fragile animal, in direct contrast to the red kangaroo, his robust companion for the evening. It's as if everyone has been given an appointment to meet at the same place in order to rummage in concert. The kangaroo, the wombat, as well as the stubborn, brush-tailed bitong. All are from the marsupial family. They love the night and this country. This land of the dream is the only one in the world where they are at home from now on. Above the marsupials, the red flying foxes gorge themselves on all the saps, the liqueurs of the world. They seem compelled to drink until they are drunk. And while there is still time, relish the flavor of these colors and the allure of these perfumes. Night for the bats will soon draw to a close, and they must take advantage up until the last drop. The winds are dying down, and the sea has calmed down around Kangaroo Island. The water is of a new clarity, so clear. The original consciousness, in this way, allows that the living can see there, in their dream of life, some strange creatures.
Berka, the mother of Yam and Cartania, has come to the shore in the hope that the storm of the previous day will have thrown her some cool mouthfuls of seaweed, which she is particularly fond of. Berka will share some of this with her son, while Cartania, weighed down by Pogo, has decided to stay inland. Yam is not used to coming to fish for seaweed. With a look, he examines the situation and verifies that he can feel safe and secure. Then he rejoins Berka, who is already bustling about on the thick carpet of marine vegetation thrown back by the sea. Yam intends to complete his gastronomical education by tasting seawater. Some gulps will suffice, but anyways, kangaroos are not big drinkers. Burka moves away and goes towards the more usual types of satisfaction. Crunchy tall grass, the heart of which bursts in her mouth, wet enough to make her avoid plunging her lips into the briny water. In the meantime, Yam has discovered a deposit of seaweed whose appearance will seem to intrigue him more than the taste. Quickly becoming tired, he will head back, knowing that his mother will join up with him in the inland in a few vigorous leaps, as soon as she has exhausted herself of the pleasures of the seaside. Perched on a high fork of a eucalyptus, a koala named Mako enjoys the kind of tranquility granted to an accomplished individual. He is male, strong, and independent. He is an upstart compared to his peers of the same sex living on the island. Without a doubt, he commands respect, but Mako is looking only for solitude and tranquility. Then, unexpectedly, a female appears. As often happens with koalas, she has decided to try and win the affections of a male, the best one she can get to ensure a healthy descendant. Therefore, it's she who rushes towards Mako, and not the reverse. Her effort will be rewarded with an outstretched hand. The light-hearted gallantries begin. The story will soon tell what the outcome will be. A bush in a bush, blonde thorns on light thorns, twigs and twigs, what a mystery. For Pogo, who one could say voyages inside his mother Cartania, this will be the enigma to solve today on the occasion of this cruise in the bush. takes on an autonomous form, shaking and shifting. Pogo is amazed, but he is still too young to leave the pouch in order to affirm the true nature of these things.
Fortunately, it's Cartania who approached and at the same time, the spectator on the balcony can gaze closer at this strange object. Cartania tires of the walk. Pogo will hardly see the echidna with his pointed nose who is just awakening from his drowsy state, a creature that cannot be found elsewhere in Australia. Now we resume our story about the koala lovers. This is the scenario. Here is Mako, a superior and calm male. And there is a female who is plagued by a sexual need which borders on the edge of being an emergency. Not long ago, Mako was accommodating. The female wants to take their relationship further, which here means going higher. A second male approaches and climbs a neighboring branch without haste. On the top part of his chest, there is a fragrant gland that distinguishes him from the females and that allows him to mark the branches he wants to identify as his property. Mako waits for the female, who will soon present herself by getting to his height. The male, too placid, hardly shows any fervor, and the female seems to ask how to hasten their embrace. Time stops, and all desires are suspended. The second male deduces that his time has come. He takes advantage by brushing up lightly against the female's hindquarters, with his nose, the most complex organ of a koala. His nasal exploration proves that the temptress is receptive and produces in him an additional excitement, making him want to mount his coveted prize. She escapes by climbing higher than him. Wanting to protect his suitor from this rival, Mako falls over towards the ground. The female finds herself at the top of this group while the two males try to tear each other to pieces. Mako, the dominant male, bites his adversary, beating him and causing him to retreat. Finally, the female finds herself alone with the koala that she set her sights on from the start. But she must wait a little longer because he has changed his mind and gone to another branch. Under the watch of a frustrated and alarmed female, he goes right, then left. An indecisive and vague acrobat. At last, Mako decides to rejoin his suitor. She waits in the fork of a branch, a position that will not make the task easy when the crucial moment comes. Soon the characteristic cries will resonate that signal among koalas, the pleasure and pain of a satisfied female.
To ensure his hold and keep his balance, Mako is obliged to attach himself to the female by the skin of her neck. This bite causes his partner a pain so great that it will be difficult to renew the act. The grunts of the female indicate to the male that the act was achieved. In spite of his reluctance, he places himself below and in his turn resonates a hoarse cry, that which expresses his own satisfaction. A new life will soon hatch in the womb of the female. It will be made, if one believes the founding legend, from the same dust as the most sacred creatures of the universe. And it's among these beings that the real men venerate the blue-tongued lizard who moves forward. His nature is divine. He is the messenger of this consciousness who in the beginning projected the world on a screen of dreams. The blue-tongued lizard is the largest of his family. His length can approach 40 centimeters, two-thirds of which is taken up by his tail. His body is thick, robust, and tough. The blue-tongued lizard adapts himself easily, but he likes to be below undulating rocky or fractured territory, where he finds flaws in which he will take cover between two prowlers. Like a mineral totem pole, Mount Artula dominates an immense plain that carves borders without seeing them. They have been drawn there by all the beings who want to claim ownership of a territory. These immaterial delimitations established by animals of diverse species intersect, are superimposed, and are finished off by forming a complex mosaic. Paraji the dingo has decided to shift and redesign his territory not far from the sacred mountain. Once the work of surveying is accomplished, he will not tolerate a pack of strangers penetrating his domain. Paraji has established his boundaries, marking them with urine or fecal matter. Sometimes he rolls on the ground to reinforce the osmosis of his odors with those of the dirt. In taking over his territory, Paraji has also concluded an alliance with the desert. The infinite sand will be his dwelling place on which he will be protected by Mount Artula. Paraji gets moving. 
he must renew the markings as frequently as he can, in regular intervals, in order that no intruders will ignore the danger towards which they would be heading if they advanced any farther. The desert will receive the mark of the dingo, the color of fire. The rock will accept his allegiance. Paraji will travel the time of the dream in a territory that he will have chosen for himself. This will be his life, the only real life, that which undulates like a blue-tongued lizard and unfurls itself on a sparkling archway of dreams.